Okay, welcome back to this um, second part of our three-part event today. We're going to now hear We're going to now hear from our five speakers, and you'll be, you know, hearing from uh, different perspectives in terms of innovation. It's a little, it's okay. There's a little bit of a buzz. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. We'll be hearing from different perspectives in the innovation space. You know, starting with the uh, per patient perspective, patient engagement, from emerging and disruptive technologies. So, you know, going deeper, taking a deeper dive into, you know, how we can innovate from the technology perspective, even though, you know, Professor James Barlow did tell us that innovation is not all of it. I'm uh, sorry, technology is not, you know, the beginning and the end of innovation. And we will um, have our last two speakers really take a quite different look of innovating from the inside and innovating the way we work and disruptive uh, ways of working inside of actually large companies, which is also quite uh, fascinating how innovation was enabled inside their organizations. As a reminder, you know, listen for nuggets, listen for value, jot down your questions, and make it personal. You know, where do you need to start to challenge your assumptions? You know, where, where do you need to or where could it be possible for you to provide new thinking you know, for yourself and for your teams. Okay, great. So we will have our um, first speaker of this piece will be Neil Williams. Is this for? Yes. Neil Williams. Neil is the head of Connected Health and director of front end <coughs> innovation for Medicom Innovation Partner, a Philips medicized company based in Cambridge. Neil consults for pharma and medical device clients, innovating and in executing strategies to enhance stakeholder engagement through connected devices and service design. Prior to Neil's commercial career, he trained at Leicester University Hospitals in operating department practice and was fa faculty for numerous advanced life support programs, having qualified in the UK and the United States. So Neil will take us into a deeper dive into the rising cost of healthcare from the perspective of patient engagement and share how technology and behavioral change shifts, sorry, and share how technology and behavioral change shifts can make a difference for patients, health systems, and business opportunities. And before handing over the floor to Neil, you know, James talked with us about the challenges of adoption. And some, thank you. Sometimes a barrier to adoption can be as simple as misunderstanding in languages. So a few years back, Neil was sharing with me that he was traveling to South Africa with a Zoll suitcase. Do you know what Zoll does? Deep, how do you say it? Defibrillators? Defibrillators? Right. And he, you know, stops, gets stopped at customs like sometimes you do, and you know, they ask him, well, what is this? What's inside this big case? And he says, oh, it's a medical device. And so they immediately take him off and park him and hold him at the customs. Because guess what? Does anybody speak Swahili or whatever we speak in South Africa? Fluently. Fluently, right. So Zol means cannabis. So here he was trying to import cannabis, trying to pass it off as a medical you know, benefit. And they didn't really take that very well. So sometimes adoption is all about, you know, cultural and differences in languages, which I found quite interesting. So well, please join me in welcoming Neil. Neil Williams. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much, GenSearch, for bringing all these great people together and, and hosting this event. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my business first, very briefly, so you understand where we come from. Um, if I ask for a show of hands, I don't expect too many will go up if I said, do you know Medicom as a business? There's a few. Right, great. That's more than we usually see. Um, so Medicom is a, a Danish company uh, based in the north of Denmark. Um, we're uh, just over 25 years old. We were founded by a joint venture between Bang & Olsen, which is a, you may know as a high-end audio system uh, TV business, and Novo Nordisk, and uh, we designed and developed the Novo Pen, uh, manufactured it in Denmark for many years, 
Um, uh, but the business evolved, and uh, about six years ago, we really started focusing on uh, rare diseases, connectivity, and service design, and that's the main focus of our company. Last summer, we were um, delighted to be acquired by Philips Medicize. It's not part of Dutch Philips, but uh, a giant contract manufacturing organization, <coughs> about an $800 million a year turnover, and 18 global uh, manufacturing facilities. Um, 45 days after that, a business called Molex came and acquired Philips Medicize, and Molex are a $4.5 billion a year global electronics uh, interconnector and fiber manufacturer who had a healthcare division. They didn't know what to do with it, so they bought Philips Medicize, and um, uh, that's now all part of our Arts of Core business. Um, and if you don't know about Molex, Molex is owned by Coke Industries, and that's a $150 billion a year private company. Uh, I'm still waiting for an invite to the Christmas party. I'm sure it's very good. <laughs> so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, patients and uh, engagement. And firstly, you know, why is this really important? And you may have had some of these numbers before, but I have my drum, and I'm going to beat it, and I'm going to keep reminding you there's a good reason to do this. Um, so about 50% of prescribed drugs are not taken uh, as they're recommended. Um, you know, chronic conditions, it can be even worse. We're looking up to 60%. Hospital admissions, now this is US data because they're great at publishing this kind of stuff, um, but you know, nearly 70%. So the numbers just keep going up and they look worse and worse. Pharma companies, oh dear, um, very slow to get into this space and to try and deal with this problem. And uh, even the economists uh, last year kind of said, this something needs to happen here. Uh, and I think we're on the beginning of that tsunami wave of things really happening. However, um, we are still uh, knocking out 125,000 Americans a year um, due to drug ad uh, uh, adherence problems. Um, that's quite a big number. That's the same as eight of these dropping out of the sky every week. Can you imagine that? If this was the airline industry, we would be held to account. Uh, but we're not. So uh, that's the end of my reminder there's a good reason to do this. Who in the room does not have a mobile phone? Great, it's almost there's less hands than last time. So this slide uh, I like to use, this is a papal address at Christmas. Um, uh, if you look at the top right, somewhere just under the zero, you can see one of those Motorola StarTac flip phones, probably a 0 0.3 megapixel camera. I, I don't imagine you can actually work out uh, uh, what's going on the stage. Um, but this is only 2013, and, it, and it'll be even better and, and more cameras now. I mean, I think if you go to a concert now, nobody takes a lighter any longer, because hopefully we don't smoke as much as we used to, but um, it, it's quite stunning. So if we think about mobile and we think about um, apps and what they're doing in healthcare, etc., about a third of physicians are prescribing apps now, recommending them. And that's quite important because if they do, you get a, a greater retention uh, of usage of their app. Um, social media is becoming increasingly important. Is there anybody in the room who doesn't have a Facebook account? Excellent. I'm glad there are some of us left. <laughs> there is some hope. Yes, that's right. Some of us will still talk to people. Um, <laughs> Now, the challenge there is that a lot of these apps, if they're generated, um, tend to be pretty singular in their purpose, and we'll look at that in just a second, but a lot of them are not exporting and sharing data. Now, if you are involved in healthcare, um, data is key to evolving delivery, care, behavior, and, and managing your own condition, but also allowing you to be managed by others. And if you can't share or export the data, what are you capturing it for? You might as well not have a Facebook account and just keep a pencil and pen in your pocket and, and send postcards. Only 2% of apps allow sharing of data. And you've got to bear in mind, this is about 160,000 different apps that have been created for healthcare. Many of them are dealing with uh, pregnancy care and wellness and weight management. But that's quite a lot of apps over, over both Android and uh, uh, Apple. So, um, you know, we have a real problem. And I think you know, if you're involved in medical devices or software as a medical device, you'll know that as soon as you start adding drug reminders, there's an organization called the FDA 
who get very interested in your application. And so far, only about 2% of all apps include medicine reminders. So even recent data uh, for, from Europe um, says that people are quite happy to share their, their health records. Okay. I've been diabetic for 40 years. Um, I have an electronic uh, insulin pump. My nurse looks at it whenever she looks, wants to look at it or whenever I ask her to. And my data is streaming, streaming up every time I plug a USB stick into my uh, laptop. Uh, and very soon it will go over my mobile phone. So you know, I'm not worried. Some people are. In some conditions, you quite rightly might not want to share your data. So I've only joined Medicom for a year and a half, but I've been doing connectivity in healthcare since 1995. Um, uh, I had hair then and uh, <laughs> a slightly tighter suit, um, but uh, it, it's changed quite a lot. But I went to a, a um, pharma conference last January, a DDP, which you may well know, and I was shocked. I saw a room full of pharma sort of commercial leaders like yourselves telling each other that doing connectivity in healthcare was really risky. Has anybody found their own personal x-ray or CT scan on YouTube yet? I don't think so. Uh, and if you look at healthcare providers and health, hospital and care systems and, and payers, they treat the data with a great deal of respect and security and they have systems in place that allow you to legitimately share that data between other professionals that have a responsibility to the patients. There's no need to be quite so worried. So when I look at um, uh, the challenge, the market's changing. We're starting to see countries now refusing to pay for drugs until 12 months have passed and until you can prove that the drug works. The payment by results gender is um, happening. Uh, I appreciate industry would like to resist it, but governments uh, and large provider organizations and payers are now demanding evidence that you get the results you claim for. And that's really challenging, because to do that, you need really good data. And you can't get good data if you're just running around with a pencil and a notebook. I will confess to being uh, very young, and uh, not now, but I was once, um, going to see my diabetes uh, consultant and filling out my me medical record book in the car with perfect numbers all the time. Then you get my lab results, and you say, these don't really correlate but apparently had the same discussion with every patient. So I, at least I'm not alone. Um, we're really now looking at outcomes, and, and, and we would often say outcome is the new income. You really need to be able to prove that your drug works. And the p-value from a clinical study with a tightly controlled population is difficult to achieve in the real world. So getting the data from the patients becomes really important. Trusting the patients to record it themselves accurately I am living evidence that that doesn't work. So then when we look at the patient and, and, and you know, when we're engaged with projects, we look at the complete stakeholder mix around a project, not, not just the patient, but it's not just their case manager or their, their you know, nurse specialist or their consultant uh, physician. It's a whole team of people around that patient that really matter and that really need to touch, feel, see the data when they want to. I can tell you every doctor we interview does not want to get a message every time one of his patients has taken a drug or has an adverse result. But they do need to be able to see it. Likewise, if I'm a patient, uh, and let's say uh, I'm somebody with heart failure, I'm not, but if I was, um, knowing that I'm taking my drugs is meaningless. I need other stuff. I need to know, is my weight changing? Is the percentage of water in my body changing? Am I active enough? These things really matter. And so there's a whole uh, ecosystem around the patient of care, but there's an ecosystem of data that needs to be created. And uh, we need to think carefully about what that is. And uh, also, um, to a point earlier, you don't want to overwhelm people with data because then it becomes meaningless. So it's about creating intelligent insight. So this is the question, really, is, is what do people really want? And I think when we're looking at creating connected drug delivery devices and service design around that, this is where we should start. 
is, is how are you going to create a really valuable experience for the patient? Something that they will use again and again and again. I probably have about 40 apps on my mobile phone. Uh, I can tell you in the last couple of days, I've probably relied on um, Uber, Eurostar, um, TripAdvisor to find somewhere decent to eat, uh, and that's about it. You know, there's probably 10 or so that I use regularly, uh, and the rest I just have there because one day I might want them again. Um, but what do I really want? What do I need for healthcare? I only want an app that solves my problems. And so what we've found is that trying to take something generic as a user experience and apply it to people with different disease types really doesn't work. You need to build something for the condition, for the patient, that will touch their lives every day, that they will engage with, and that will encourage them to collect data, even if they're doing it passively. And if you have data, you can demonstrate results. So um, one of the great things about uh, uh, enjoying two rapid sessions of due diligence last year, which I'm sure you'll appreciate, allows for plenty of rest uh, and lots of fun with spreadsheets, um, is that we now have a, a, you know, a very rich sugar daddy. Um, and in some ways, that's a really great thing because we're now uh, in the middle of building our sort of third generation of connected health. And uh, we're trying to innovate and game change. So historically, what we will have done for our clients is created something for that franchise, very vertical for a disease state, the franchise commercial lead held the budget and the strings and uh, it, it's their neck on the block. Um, but it wouldn't transpose to the franchise lead in the next office. They could be doing the same thing, maybe with a different consultancy, and millions of euros and dollars are being spent on building things, some of which don't serve any medical benefit, they're just a marketing engagement, some of which do, but that investment is lost when you go to the next project and you start again. And some of that's due to a historical view of, of uh, device controls and design controls you would have you know, under regulation. But you know, we've had a lot of engagement with the FDA around these approaches and, and we're trying to move away from that. So we've now embarked on uh, creating a, a platform uh, much in the same way that you would create a, a leading health information exchange that will expose uh, programming interfaces for mobile, web, and, and uh, desktop clients, on top of which you can create branded experiences for each franchise within a business. And, and this entire platform was um, designed so that each of our clients um, will have their own private environment for this. Um, it's designed to be hosted and deployed globally. We actually use the same hosting provider that the US National Security Agency and FBI use, so the data is quite safe. Um, other governments use it too, uh, uh, and it's designed really to address the global challenge, but for our clients not to have to make the big investment. So we are doing innovation with millions of dollars to create a technology layer that we will be able to provide to our clients on a per patient, uh, per month basis cost. And, and, and that should reduce the barrier, because the barrier to date often is in the business case when you go and say, well, I'm going to spend, you know, two and a half, three million dollars on creating an IT solution for my rare disease drug. Somebody's probably going to stop that effort happening. Um, if we can change the game so that, you know, we as a, a large, wealthy back business can take the risk and share that risk across a number of clients, then um, it becomes more like a joint venture and a shared risk model. And, and our success will become your success. So I think what we've tried to do here uh, on the theme of innovation is really look at the needs, really look at the technologies that are out there that we can use that are proven, um, and then create a way of that working that services the business needs, so the business model changes as well. Um, and to, just to give you some kind of uh, um, feedback about this, the technology that underpins uh, our clinical data scheme and integration uh, is the same technology that services the United States Veterans Affairs and uh, uh, Department of Defense, uh, and all the Netherlands and Chile. So just a quick example, this is something we, we, we built, I'm happy to talk about it later, but uh, a connected injector with Bluetooth, an app and mobile device up to a private cloud and share that back into the ecosystem as needed. Thank you very much.